I guess we can review and approve the minutes. Um, everyone get a chance to see those? Um, I know Gabi sent them out uh, last week. Yeah, and then I made the one change to the, to the name. That's pretty much the only change I made. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, any comment on the minutes? Uh, first, you have a motion, a second, then comments. Okay, thank you. I move to approve the minutes. I second no, it. Second. So that sounds like discussion exactly. is the right. Is the... There you go. Uh, would anyone like to discuss the minutes? Uh, that sounds like none. Uh, shall we take a vote? Um, I guess I, I'll call the roll. Uh, uh, Carolyn Mish. Yes. Deb Clemmer. Yes. Marissa Elkins. Yes. Eric Winkler. Yes. Louis Hasbrook. Yes. And Ben Weil. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So now we've got a, a bunch of things on the on the agenda. This the, I, I kind of apologize that the agenda is so heavy on me reporting stuff out. <laughs> Um, but uh, at least this first one is both reporting stuff out and asking for money. So, you know, there's, there's something to do. So let's see, I'm going to share my screen and, um, and all of my emails, apparently. Mm. Uh, why can't I hide this thing? Okay. So um, I want to tell you about a project that we're working on and um, and then see if I can get your approval for uh, funding for the part of it that we can't that we haven't covered. So uh, why DC fast chargers? Um, so the the original impetus for this was the experience of Department of Health and Human Services got two, new vans that are uh, uh, battery electric vans and didn't have a place to charge them. And with these larger uh, vans, they have larger batteries, which means they take longer to charge. Um, and so a level two charger can take a fairly long time. You gotta make sure that you're able to leave them overnight on the charger. Um, and we were looking for various charging opportunities. And among the reasons to go for uh, fast chargers was simply that there were better incentives available. So we could get fast chargers for less money than level two chargers. Uh, we have a bunch of other EV vehicles in the municipal fleet. Um, and at what we're gonna talk about, uh, what's later on the agenda is our new policy is likely to increase that EV fleet. Um, and we need to kind of get ahead of that by making sure that we have a charging system. So fast chargers will enable behavior more similar to, to what's currently happening when, when a municipal fleet fuels up at the DPW. Um, and in particular, leaving EVs on the level two chargers that are public chargers now has this problem of if people leave work at 4.30 and they leave a vehicle on at 4.30, that means during this peak time when the public might come and want to charge, there may be a, a municipal vehicle charging. Um, so there's a bunch of reasons to have an alternative approach. And I think it's gonna really change the way people behave with their EVs. So for example, you, uh, you have a, a municipal EV, you come back to do some paperwork and to pick up something uh, from the office, you just put the, the vehicle on the fast charger. And even if it's only 15 minutes, you've gone most of the way to refilling your uh, battery and then you're off to do whatever else you're doing. Um, but it's also important to make EV uh, DC fast chargers available to the public. Um, really, if we think about policy wise for the kind of like our entire region, if we want people to feel comfortable purchasing EVs, they have to believe that there's an EV, a fast charger network available to them so they can go wherever they wanna go. 
Um, and in particular, we've got I-91s. We've got people basically going from New York to Vermont or New York to, through New Hampshire or to even to Quebec. Um, and we could be an important stop on that way. Um, and if we can draw drivers in who might otherwise not stop in Northampton, they now have a reason to stay for half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour and a half uh, to charge up their car and also to patronize our businesses. And, you know, we, we have some coffee shops um, and uh, that so that's a business benefit. It may enable residents near the downtown area to consider EVs, even if they don't have a way to charge them at home, because when you're able to treat a charger more like we treat gas stations now, you can just fill up. And as these battery capacities have people, you know, with a range of, of 300 miles and so, um, you don't have to charge up every single day for mo most people are doing trips in the 40 to 80 mile range or less. So that's uh, that's kind of the motivation for fast chargers. Um, here's where we're planning on locating them. Um, so we have, for reasons that have to do with getting the incentives from the utilities, we're designating uh, two of them as fleet chargers, municipal fleet chargers, and two of them as public chargers. Um, but in reality, we can make fleet chargers available to the public and using the app, our drivers of fleet vehicles can actually reserve the fast chargers so that they're they're available when they pull in. Um, so we we have a lot more flexibility than is implied by by these designations. Um, the reason that this is the best location is one. So these stripes that were indicated are actually will actually be a bit more slopey so that you can fit those long DHHS vans in, um, and so so it's a bit more of an angle like like these ones here. Um, but this is the shortest conduit run from uh, from the um, uh, transformer. So that's this is the least cost location uh, to put the, the fast chargers in. Um, and again, it's really centrally located, close enough to 91, should be able to draw people into the downtown business area. Um, so this is four fast charger ports, two public, two municipal, and we've already talked about how we, they're kind of swappable in reality. Um, we should have an engineer out very, very soon, like this week, to confirm on the uh, uh, the transformer capacity. And uh, assuming that's approved, we, we could begin work quite soon. The total cost for the equipment and the conduit and the installation is just under uh, 300K. And the National Grid Award, with, there's make ready and uh, re uh, refunds on the uh, chargers themselves. It's a whole bunch of stacking of, of incentives. Gets us pretty close, but not all the way there. Um, and so our request to the commission is to approve uh, using uh, twelve thousand two hundred and thirty-eight dollars from the Energy and Sustainability Revolving Fund to basically make the difference between the cost and all the incentives that we're able to get, um, which I think is a pretty good deal. Um, and I wanted to talk about how this fits into the rest of the plan that that we have which is about starting to charge for electricity which we have not done up till now for all these uh level two chargers once we've installed these fast chargers we certainly want to be charging for electricity so um we have the ability to do that we are going to be uh going to city council to ask for the creation of a revolving fund to accept revenue from the charger network and that revenue can be used to pay the electric bills associated with e each of these chargers. Um, and so we'll, we'll set it up so municipal vehicles don't actually pay, but obviously the city's paying. Um, and then public users uh, will, will start to begin paying electricity. Um, so the, this revolving fund that can be used for electric bills and um, it can be used to expand the charger network, 
but it can't be used legally to repay the energy and sustainability revolving fund. So we're not able to do like we did with um, uh, the, with the, the updating the solar uh, arrays where the SRECs that we sold, the the value the 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 income from the from the from those sales could go into the energy and sustainability revolving fund. This would be uh, a depletion from the energy and sustainability revolving fund, but it would enable a new revolving fund to start accumulating. And so this would what one would think would be the last time we would come to this commission for the ENS revolving fund looking to expand the charger network, if that makes any sense. Um, so that that's the ask. Um, so I will, uh, that, that, that was all I had. Um, so I'd open it up for any discussion. Um, yeah, Ben, can I, yeah. I, I have two questions um, and a comment. Um, how, how much is in the fund currently? Um, I the last time I looked, it was something like ninety k. Okay, and what what is roughly the annual income to the fund currently? That's hard because we have been failing to sell SREX or Rex in this case um, because of meters that had failed or communications equipment that wasn't installed, and in fact. Uh, thanks to the, the last time we came to the commission for uh, for some funding, we have made some progress on that, but the meter is still not communicating. Do I have that correct, Gabrielle? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and I don't think we can get the money that we lost from the past, unfortunately. Oh, is that um, right? Okay. Yeah, because basically we could have been manually reporting and we we weren't. So that I don't think we're gonna be able to get that money back, um, but the panels are back up and working. It's just the meter. So is it is it $5,000 in SRX or is it $10,000 roughly? It was 4,000 that we had missed out on from the past for- for past, past two years or past year? For the past, for the total amount of time that it's been down. Which is? Um, I think it was 2022 is when it went down. Okay. So, okay. So my comment is that um, th th this is a small, small investment for the city. It adds value to the municipal departments to be able to charge their vehicles. It has the added benefit of, um, well, I'm not sure there's an added benefit of allowing folks uh, public to use it in, in the sense that they're not paying, they're just paying the electricity and there's no profit on that, but. No, there would be. Okay. So, okay. That, so, so basically I'm saying, I, I, I don't think it's so much money depleting the fund and there's income to the fund that will continue to allow us to do these little projects. So. I'm in favor of this. I think it's a, I think it's a great, great spot and 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 good for the city. Thanks. Uh, any other? Yeah, Louis. Uh, I think that you know, at um, basically five percent of the total investment to get four fast chargers in without, um, you know, does for me that's as far as I need to go with the process. I know that there's issues charging the electrical vehicles that the city has now down in uh, my neighborhood and by fist fights in front of the charging stations and things. <laughs> Should just say that piece. Um, how does it go along with the proposal for the uh, Pleasant Journey space on, um, on uh, Pleasant Street? Is this gonna, is this the same sorts of charging stations that they're proposing or we don't know? Uh, they're not the same brand, but they are level two, uh, a level three fast chargers. Right. Um, you know, you, you could make an argument that it's it's in some sense uh, competing, but I think if things are going the way that we think they're going, you, you know, there are there's going to be plenty of demand for level three chargers. 
Um, and since their business model, the, the Pleasant Journey uh, business model is about having a cafe. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my thinking is that, like, mm -hmm. there are some cafes in, in downtown, too. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Clemmer? Um, yeah, I I, uh, I agree. I think it's, I, since we're getting almost the whole thing paid for, I think it's very, very worthwhile to take advantage of this now because that kind of benefit might not last forever. And um, yeah, and the more we charge, fast charges we have, the more incentive, incentive it is for people to jump off the highway and come here and and charge up and get some coffee or shop and hang out get some ice cream and uh get back in the car so yeah i think you know the more we can do to to draw people into downtown the better and you know with the money being covered it's kind of a no-brainer for me thank you uh carolyn yeah, sorry, I can't figure out I, on my update how to raise my virtual hand. So <laughs> um, I think, you know, I totally agree. I think this is worth it. I think I just had a couple questions. Actually, you said this potentially if we vote today, that gives us essentially the funding. Is this um, and that it could start in September. So are there chargers available or is it something that and then and is National Grid going to be doing directing sort of the install is that part of the partnership or do we have to sort of contract out the whole um you know construct the trenching and installation of the um, conduit and utility and all that so it's kind of a turnkey operation we, there's a, a contractor on statewide contract also approved by national grid so kind of like the procurement pathway is already done okay. And we worked right. with a company called Voltrek and they're going to handle everything. I mean, even oh, the right. line, line painting is part of their proposal. Um, so, and quite frankly, they're doing the interface with National Grid for us as well. Perfect. Okay. So then it really could be something that happens um, fairly expeditiously. Okay. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Thanks. Uh, any other comments? Does anyone feel like giving a motion? Can, can I just say one other thing about the yeah. value of this? So I know I forgot about the Pleasant Journey fast chargers going in, but honestly, I'm not really sure that those have the same kind of public value relative to um, um, being a a, a a a a pedestrian downtown, it's it's kind of far away. I mean, people might do that, but you know, you can do a back of the envelope calculation. You know, if you have two two customers for ten hours, you know, public people they spend twenty bucks. Uh, you know, in a on a an hour of noodling around town. I mean, we're gonna generate. I mean, again, it's just back them up. You know, it's like one hundred twenty thousand dollars of of spending a year, so it's a no brainer. Twelve thousand dollars is is a great economic investment to, for the downtown, and I think the added value to the municipal department is is you know I think already there too. So let's let's uh, let's let's vote. I, <laughs> Did you want to make a motion? <laughs> Well, unless there's more discussion. I move to approve. I second it. Okay. Uh, so I, I will call the roll. Uh, Carolyn Mish? Yes. Uh, Marissa Elkins? Yes. Eric Winkler? Yes. Louis Hasbrook? Yes. Deb Clemmer? Yes. Ben Weil? Yes. Okay, the motion is approved. Uh, thank you guys very much, because I'm really looking forward to getting this project going. Um, so uh, another vehicles topic. <laughs> um, and um, and I, I sp spoke um, uh, with Deb Clemmer earlier about this one. Um, where is it? I'm so bad at this. <sighs> Uh, 
Oh, did I lose my? Give me one one second to find my little presentation. Um, okay, so last time we met, we actually uh, we gave you uh, you you guys gave us advice on a draft of a procurement policy. We pretty much took all your advice, including um, some of the discussion about more explicitly uh, uh, and um, emphasizing the financial benefits or the 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 cost effectiveness component. Um, and so I I rather than kind of pouring over the document, which we we can do if, if you want to, um, it, so it was approved uh, by the mayor, um, and and it's just an, it's an internal city policy, and it's useful for uh, um, uh, getting us climate leader certification. Um, but we, uh, uh, but I just want to look at the the main thing. So it its objectives were accelerate adoption of emissions uh, reduction technologies. We wanted to minimize the financial impacts of fleet vehicles to the city. Um, and minimize the long-term environmental impacts of fleet vehicles. So those are equal objectives. To optimize the composition of the fleet for fuel efficiency, advanced electric charging infrastructure. The last thing we discussed is part of that. And prioritize the use of, of incentives and things that we have available to get both, both the efficiency and the cost effectiveness. Um, and so this new written policy very explicitly uh, ranks the priorities and says you should essentially try and get a battery electric vehicle if it's if it's appropriate if not look for a plug-in hybrid vehicle if it's appropriate otherwise a hybrid and if there's none of those available then you should go for a as high an efficiency uh, internal combustion engine vehicle that meets the functions uh, required and the exemptions that, that we discussed before uh, are, are still there. So off-road vehicles, heavy-duty vehicles, um, and uh, most of the DPW big big uh, equipment and fire engines and so forth um, are exempt. Um, so the basic policy is that you, re you replace things when they're starting to cost too much to, to keep. Um, but here's where we kind of want, want it to be really explicit that the functional requirements of the vehicle are reviewed for replacement. And that in some cases, you may be able to get a smaller, lower cost or more fuel efficient vehicle uh, than what you might have had, than the vehicle that it's replacing. So looking at what it's actually doing. Um, and in these considerations, we're giving equal weight to minimizing life cycle carbon dioxide equivalent emissions and minimizing life cycle cost of ownership to the city. Um, so looking first at financial considerations, we're going to incorporate a life cycle costing model to take the purchase price, incentives, rebates, um, and, and tax, tax re rebates, maintenance cost, lifetime during the expected duration, depreciation, and fuel or electricity cost. Um, and so the CAPA department is using basically using a federal database that is updated with the vehicles that are available to put these vehicles through a variety of tests to try to find the the best vehicle um we also would will be using a model uh that's been developed by our national national lab to evaluate these vehicles on their life cycle emissions so we're actually going to take into account battery production and uh and raw materials um, and try to come up with with a way that we're balancing both. Um, so I, I wanted to just this is really an update, but I wanted you to get a sense of what this uh, process was like. So um, uh, Gabby and I helped, but uh, but we uh, we've built a form that we're hoping that department heads will use or requesters will use before they request a vehicle to talk about, you know, what's the vehicle going to be used for? So, you know, we we can 
collect this information and we're going to find out, you know, is this a vehicle that's driving fairly few miles a day and therefore may not need a tremendously large range and therefore not a tremendously large battery, which makes it cost less. Does it need a whole lot of tools and items that it's going to transport? Or is it really just a vehicle that transport a person, say, across town to write a, a parking ticket? Um, you know, does a vehicle drive on unpaved roads or, or snow, on snowplowed roads? So really, does it have to be an all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive vehicle? Um, and then are they going on longer trips? This might push some, some vehicle choices if it was a, a bunch of really long trips towards um, a, a plug-in hybrid or, or something like that. And then for trucks, we, we try to get to the capacity that's actually required um, because one thing we'll find is that some of these trucks that we've been buying may be over-specified for what they're actually doing, and it may be that other vehicles are the, are the more appropriate ones. So the idea is to look at the requirements rather than what's the vehicle you want. Then Kappa gets this, these data, and we can run that through um, a, a bunch of comparison tools. So I'll show you an example of that. This is... Um, this is updated less frequently, so we actually are building our own uh, essentially recapitulation of this model. But uh, let's say we wanted to uh, find ourselves a pickup truck. Uh, so then this this was a, a project uh, by a, a lab at MIT. Um, so we've got some Ford. We've got a Ford F-150 Lightning. We've got a Ford F-150 two-wheel drive, but the Lightning is a four-wheel drive. So let's say we really wanted a four-wheel drive uh, Ford, and we might uh, we might say, well, let's let's take a look at this hybrid version. Okay, so we've got a hybrid, an EV, and a, and a regular gas-powered Ford F-150, and we can compare them for for costs. So in terms of dollars per month for uh, levelized over the life cycle of, of the vehicle, the Ford F-150 uh, costs less than the, um, uh, the other two options and it emits lower uh, greenhouse gases. So in, in this case, and we can view it this way if, if you want to. So you can see though, that in, in terms of costs, most of that cost is vehicle acquisition, right? But afterwards, you're spending very little on electricity and very little on maintenance compared to the other two. Um, but your greenhouse gas emissions are lower. And we can do the same for any variety of, of, of vehicles. It's kind of kind of fun if you're in, into this kind of thing. So that's one of the passes that we're going to do to try to evaluate the vehicles that we select. We also want to make sure that if possible, we're selecting a vehicle that's actually um, uh, eligible for a tax credit. So um, uh, let, let's say we're, we're, we're just looking at all electric ones. So you can see that um, there are some Rivians that are available for tax credit. That's, those are a pickup truck. Um, and there is, and there's the Ford F-150. So they're both eligible. And we could go back to here and we could say, wow, the Rivian costs more to operate, to own and operate, and it doesn't really do any better. In fact, it's a little bit worse on carbon emissions. So it's really not a contest. And if we can get our tax credit on the Ford F-150, that's that's the one to use. So that's the kind of process that we do. And then we would return to the, um, the requester. Here's a list of three vehicles that we think would satisfy what you're requesting and would meet the policy. And hopefully they would select one of those that would then go through um, it, the same capital uh, CIP process that they're currently doing, although we're updating the forms to make that easier and, and a little uh, slicker. Um, and then they'd still go to the same advisory board, the same inputs from, from council, and hopefully we would be able to share either through them or through um, the, the CIP process the background of what they had requested and what we had recommended. Um, so that's that's the process. And the thing I wanted to add to this is that, um, I wonder why this is doing this, that we're also looking at 
a fleet management approach. And I know this is something uh, that um, Councilor Elkins has had been interested in. And we um, we identified 25 vehicles that are currently owned that are easily shareable, meaning that they're all kind of in the downtown uh, cluster of, of users, um, but they're distributed to all these different departments. And some of them, that a good third of them are traveling about four or five miles per day, which means in reality, they're spending multiple days not traveling at all. So that means that if we could share them, uh, we could potentially do away with, we could just simply own fewer vehicles um, and that therefore maintain fewer vehicles. And we just need a software and a automated key box so that people can reserve the vehicle they want. And we need to be able to assure people that they get the vehicle that's appropriate for their trip. You know, nobody's ever out of a vehicle. And so, so there's a software to do it. And we, we've contacted a, 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 a contractor. Um, and so uh, it, we're, we're looking at what the, the potential savings are, or the the costs are, but potentially the savings can accumulate as you're able to whittle down the size of the fleet. And then much of this procurement that we just discussed can also go towards moving the whole fleet towards more electrified while having fewer vehicles total and therefore reducing the overall cost. Um, but that's just something we're working on. It's kind of like just giving you a, an update on that. Um, so that that was the share, and I don't think there was anything to that other than updating you, but I'd love to hear any feedback uh, or comment that you have. Yes, Carolyn? Um, I, I think this is um, uh, this is great. I really, I like the fact that you, there's some data points about and the ability to look at what the needs are as opposed to just sort of what individuals might think they want or need for a vehicle to do city work. Um, and that sort of makes it more of a objective review. Um, so, I, and I think that's great because I think in these conversations that when vehicle acquisition has come up previously, um, you know, it's always come in the CIP process that this is the vehicle this department is requesting and that's that. Um, so to be able to put some figures to it, I think it's really helpful. And um, and certainly looking at um, shared vehicles um, is something, you know, that we haven't done. And I think that it makes sense to sort of evaluate that and dig a little bit deeper. I think that's a little bit of a um, a mindset change probably for some departments, um, but hopefully it, there's support and it makes sense um, for folks. Yeah, I think we, you know, so I've interacted a little bit on this subject because I went around reading odometers. <laughs> um, and, uh, it, you know, so like for instance, Board of Health is pretty enthusiastic about the idea. Um, and I, I don't want to step on Louis' uh, thund thunder, but um, probably the building inspectors, uh, for a bunch of reasons, might not participate. It might not be as advantageous to them, largely because they, by trade, they keep different tools in specific vehicles. And actually, their odometer readings show that their vehicles actually do travel a fair amount. Um, and so the benefit of sharing is less from from there than say central services, which is also enthusiastic, which has some vehicles that never move. <laughs> um, uh, I guess Eric and then Louis, uh, Louis, you did want to say no. No, I'm, uh, I'm I, I can wait on this one. Okay, uh, Eric. Yeah, so I, I agree with everything Carolyn said. I think, um, creating the decision tools and the template for departments to utilize to start that process um, is really, it's really cool. It's good stuff. The um, one thing I would add is that I think um, as part of this, I'm always sort of concerned about like resistance to change. 
Um, and so my recommendation would be that you develop a process document so that folks can see like, you know, okay, we need new, you know, too expensive to keep this thing going. We need a new one. And then, then it shows, you know, okay, then you get this form, you fill it out, you send it to you. Three days later, you return back with it. You know, I mean, just be really clear about what the process looks like so that the folks that are going to be using this don't don't have a, a lot of questions about it. They know that it's it's all set and you're gonna you're gonna be able to move forward with with a decision. So I'm I'm supportive of this. Well thank you. Uh Councilor Clemmer. Um yeah um yeah thanks for speaking with me today and um you know being a newer counselor I am just hearing about the, all this and um um, does this include all cars out there available to us, or is it? Oh, wait, which thing actually? So the the graph that you put up and um, the cars you would be looking at is that every car? No, or is it's it not. Every cars. It, yeah, so it updates like the 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 MIT lab that created that. They do update it, but not frequently enough necessarily for us. The federal government does better with fueleconomy.gov. And so that's kind of where we'll take those inputs and search for, for vehicles. Then once we found potential vehicles, we actually have to, if if it's not already in the MIT one, which is easy, because like you just have to do your settings. I have built a calculator that basically imitates what they've done. The spreadsheet spreadsheet version it's ugly but we can then take the data about those vehicles and get the same output um essentially using using the same in uh methods that they use um but yeah so it, it, some vehicles will take more work and then there are a lot of vehicles that are unique like we have a lot of um transit vans the the e transit vans that are they're that kind of like what the city buys for like work trucks um, and those um, have a lot of different specifications and you really have to just get what the actual specs are on that one and plug it in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's going to make it easier for department heads to just fill out a form and um, and have you guys, you know, recommend vehicles. You said you would recommend three to each, um, for each request. So they'll pick in one of those and... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it it's good. You know, it's going to be a really good thing for everybody, and I'm for it. Mm -hmm. I uh, can I chime in? Yes, please. Per usual, I'm driving, so I can't raise my hand. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that I do these meetings. I'm inevitably uh, in the car driving to the least environmentally friendly sport ever, which is hockey. Um, I no, apologize. No, 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 it's golf. <laughs> oh, oh golf is really bad it's true but yeah. hockey's pretty bad skiing's bad too i think mm -hmm. uh at any rate um thank you for following up on this i know i i spouted up an idea i i and i'm sorry we didn't connect to talk a little bit more but um i i'm really excited about where you you know how you threw this out um I would say, um, I, I think this is, um, I'm glad to see this. I'm glad to see movement on that. Um, I have served on the, the CIP advisory committee now for a few years and we go through this process. I, I, I And I know you're talking to department heads, Ben, so, um, so you know where there's pushback or where you're hearing that, you know, reservations. Um, but I, 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 I'm guessing you didn't find from anybody that it was a new idea uh, because we've been sort of pushing back and sending people back to the drawing board for better choices, but they haven't had these tools um, and 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 guidance um, to to help them. And so that's been a thing. And and I would just add there, um, and because of that, I, I have seen two things over the years. One is, you know, there is some amount of, uh, you know, just you know, sort of car lust of, you know, yeah. I, oh, my department gets a new car and that, you know, that, that electric Mustang looks really cool. And, you know, and I'm not, and I don't fault anybody for that, you know, and that's part of the, you know, that that's a thing that happens when, when it's your job to think about procurement for, for your department. Right. Um, yeah. 
And um, the other thing is, she was, and there have been some misses, and not just misses um, uh, in terms of the sustainability aspect of it, but I think this process bringing in another pair of eyes to, or, or another pair, another more eyes to, um, to really talk through the department. It's what their specifications are, and as I, like you said, over some over specification of for the purposes. I, I think a little bit. I hate to say it, but a little bit more bureaucracy might uh, might help that. I mean, we don't want to encumber things too much. Um, so I like that this these tools are efficient, and this process is efficient, and and also um, you know keeps our keeps everybody's eye on both the the ball of the sustainability issues and then also whether or not they really are specking out the right car for the for the job so so that's all thank you for this work yeah, yeah i appreciate that um you know and i think what, when you're saying about the process and not impeding we're hoping that people do it early enough in the process that it becomes a dialogue you know so we may send them three suggestions they may hate all three and then instead of just you know, well, it's too late, just do one of these. Maybe we are able to actually discuss with them, okay, what 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 is it that you're really needing? What did we miss? And you know, and hopefully that will also infect their way of thinking so that they start to um start to be selecting on these other on other uh category uh categories as well. So yeah, and I and oh, I'm sorry. No, I, yeah, gonna... and I would just just tag on to that to say. That, that's it. That's right. We so we have been pushing back. These are not new ideas, but it does come relatively later in the process. So there, there is there when we have been raising. Although now it's been a few years, so I think mm -hmm. the department heads have been coming into these into this process. By the time they get to the advisory committee and to council and those questions, they you know they're getting used to these questions. But it is they have less time to make a move to to. To, to re to rethink what they're asking for. So this this is good. I agree. Like just just we start the process with this in mind and and the tools to do it. So it's great. Cool. Well thank you. Uh any other discussion on this topic? Okay, cool. Um so I have Valley Green Energy update. Um and, and the main reason I wanted to add to, to add this for this group, um, and Adele Franks is here and, and Carolyn Mish, so, you know, like the, the people have been in it longer than I have. Um, but uh, it is a, a new thing, and I think you're going to be getting questions from people. And so I thought it might be a good forum to get the basics out and have some, have some discussion about it. Um, so, uh, Actually, let me see if I can um, uh, share again. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why I'm so terrible at this right now. Um, actually, I think the way I'm going to do it is just go to. Um, so there is now a website, Valley Green Energy dot org. Um, which of course I misspelled. <laughs> this is this is embarrassing. <laughs> um, here we go. I'm going to share this screen. I'm, I apologize. Uh, so. Um, uh, I think it's September 6th, these postcards are going to be mailed out uh, to uh, Northampton residents. Um, and, you know, there's now there's a website. Uh, so, August 26th, August that, 24th or something. Oh, do I have the date wrong? Yeah, it's in August. Oh, okay. It'll be mailed out. Okay. Well, they're, they're being mailed out soon anyway, <laughs> August. Okay. So yeah, end of August. Um, and so they're, they're going to go to people and some people will be, will get it. 
that you're automatically enrolled, you do nothing. And if you are not already a, uh, if you do not have a supplier who is a third party supplier already, and you're on the basic service for National Grid, you're gonna be automatically enrolled in the Valley Green, Green Energy Standard Green, which has 10% more RECs associated with it than what's required by law. But, and I'll get into this in a minute, you can opt up or down on those categories. So National Grid will does have a, a higher price. So this is a savings for residents and that it has a little bit on the postcard to, to help you read your bill. And you're gonna see that you're gonna have uh, a, a, a new energy supplier that's not National Grid. Um, and that you'll see that the electricity price will be the Valley Green energy price. And it, you know, so it, it walks you through some of that, but my experience already is that there will be lots of questions. Um, so one thing that's quite good is um, that there is uh, a website. I think it's actually a pretty good website, uh, Valley Green Energy uh, is .org, but it actually goes to Mass Power Choice uh, slash Valley Green Energy. Um, it has a lot of the same information. It describes it, you know, kind of clearly like there's, you know, there's supply, that's what's changing. Delivery is not changing um, and you get no change in your service. It kind of goes uh, out for that. People can uh, change their options so they can opt out. So that's the main thing is if you don't want to participate, like for instance, you just really like National Grid and you want to keep using their basic service and paying more money, um, you know, you, you can opt out. Um, you can also change your option. Uh, so um, actually, I have never even looked at this part of the page. So you can do it on the website, but you can also uh, do it um, with the, uh, the uh, phone, you know, with the phone call. Um, so people can change from the auto enroll, which has the 10% additional recs. They can change, they, they can swap down to less expensive electricity with fewer renewable energy credits, or they can move up to 100% of their electricity being associated with renewable energy credits. Um, and we can, and I expect Eric might have a lot to say here about um, how how to talk about the value of uh, whoops of those renewable energy credits? So I think I will maybe I'll I'll leave my screen shared, um, and Eric talk, and then if I can find the necessary thing on the website, then I'll use that. <laughs> but but go ahead, Eric. I think you're muted. You mean Eric Winkler? Or? Oh, yeah, oh yeah. I'm sorry, Eric. Eric Winkler had his hand up. Is that who you're asking? Are Are you giving me the floor? I was, yeah, because you raised your okay, hand. Okay, sorry, I had mute on, and that was part of the problem. Um, on the first, on the front of the flyer, or the where the flyer shows National Grid's rate. You know, I I'm sure people are not following the DPU rate making process on a regular basis. But you know that that rate is traceable to the current um, approved rates for August first, twenty twenty four through January thirty first, twenty twenty five, and I think I think you said at our last meeting, and this is kind of where I want a little back up here is our. The rate under VGE, the standard rate, is is most likely never going to be more than National Grid's basic service rate for electricity. I mean, you'll note this little uh, caveat: it cannot be guaranteed. So what? So the benefit is we've negotiated a good price, and it locks in that price for two years. 
and the price does not change seasonally. Like if you look at um, wow. all the other the, the basic uh, uh, rates, they do change seasonally. So there's stability for two years. It is possible that National Grid's basic service could dip below uh, Valley Green Energy's uh, price. In most cases over kind of recent history with the uh, aggregations like this, there have been occasional dips below, but also rises above because of the variability of the rates over a year. So that on average, the aggregation customers do have a lower rate on average. Um, but yeah, it's not guaranteed. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I hear you. I, I mean, you can't guess, and I, I, I'm glad that there's a the note there. You know, indicates that it's it's the rate is what I mean. It doesn't say this is the grid's rate for the next six months, which would be more more explicit. Um, but I mean, I think this is a this is a challenge. You know, it's the 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 challenge is balancing the value added from doing an aggregation um um to the value added for with respect to climate change for having a a guaranteed component that is that is um renewable um and i don't think we'll be able to determine anytime soon <clears throat> whether the DPU is going to change basic services requirements for a renewable. I mean, there's renewables in grids, basic service. It's not explicit. Yes. It's not explicitly stated, but it uh, is not on this postcard, but I think actually in our, um, I'm going to go to this more elaborate one. Uh, but actually while, while um, I'll look for that. Um, but uh, Eric Broadbent, do you want to add stuff while I'm <laughs> hunting for that? I just wanted to mention that having had experience with this, um, the DPU very uh, is does not allow you to say that it will be cheaper. You you need to essentially say it. That's one of our goals. But you you can't advertise it as being cheaper. That's false advertising. Right. So uh, here on again on that web website, and um, you know, really, I'm seeing this group as the group that should be well informed because there will be either residents or constituents um, who may ask you about it. Um, so getting into that question about renewable uh, or renewable energy credits, um, we it does get complicated. There's the distinction between wind and solar only class one renewable energy credits and other uh, forms of power that get renewable energy credits, but are so that are renewable in a certain way, but may, may not be clean. So bioenergy, landfill gas, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, Valley Green Energy is looking for, is only buying the class one Massachusetts recs that are associated with uh, essentially non-combustion based um, or an, and non-nuclear um, uh, renewable energy credits. Um, so you can see as required by state law, we're at now 24% of the annual electricity provided by any provider, including the utilities, needs to have renewable energy credit. So, so have, have either purchased those credits from somebody else or have been actually generated and keep keeping those credits. Valley Green Energy would then add 10% as the standard package that puts us at 34%. Or if you opted up, you could get 100%. Um, and again, these are credits. They're not really, of course, renewable electrons traveling into your, your house. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, any other, yeah, Eric, go ahead. 
Winkler. I think you may still be muted. Sorry. Um, yeah, just sort of FYI on the, the other category. Um, typically in New England, uh, nuclear is somewhere around 20% of the supply. Um, and uh, renewables anywhere from like five to eight percent. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's variable on a daily, you know, throughout the day. Obviously, the solar component, which is I think somewhere around four to five thousand megawatts. Um, obviously, there's nothing at night. Um, and then um, there is a some pretty um, couple of substantial sized refuse uh, uh, power generation. Um, mm -hmm. And those also would would fall under the renewable uh, component. So just as a general sort of thing, you know, the, if you look at what is supplying uh, New England, um, you know that new that 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 um, that renewable component in total is is almost about twenty percent right now. And mm -hmm. of that, maybe five percent of that is is not solar or wind it it it's either hydro or or nuclear i'm sorry you add, add if you add hydro in that's another 12% so it's it's actually uh closer to 40% yeah um and of course not all of those are associated with renewable energy credits and just uh, right and and i don't know how much everybody understands or even wants to understand <laughs> but um basically the renewable energy credits are a, a way of accounting for the renewableness of power production, because we obviously, you can't tell what, what one electron from another. Um, and it's a system of credits for the, the purpose of creating a market. And if you create a market that you can create scarcity on the market by buying and retiring those credits, when you create scarcity, you uh, raise the price of a credit hopefully to the point where it's actually more cost effective to build a new renewables facility and therefore increase renewable energy production because now you can sell that credit at a higher price. Um, so that's kind of the market design, but it's an entirely artificial market. And Valley Green Energy will be participating in that market by buying credits and causing our bill to be a little higher than it would be uh, if we do the basic uh, um, uh, offering, which just matches the, the what's required by law. Um, so any desire to keep discussing this? Any questions about this? I don't want to drag, drag this out at all. Okay. Um, uh, any, um, oh, sorry, uh, Adele, yes. I just want to point out that should the national grid price go down, people can opt out at any time. They can Sorry. opt out at any time. And so uh, that takes care of that problem. Yes. And one, one small wrinkle is that if you opt out, you can't opt back in. You can opt back in, but you are not guaranteed the Valley Green Energy price. Um, and, and that's a small detail, but you know, it is kind of people going in and out. Um, it, it, it's probably not going to be a very frequent thing. Okay. Eric. No, I just curious who, who developed the flyer and who's, who's developed the website? Uh, so mass power choice, which is a group from Peregrine Energy, Basically, they do aggregations or they provide guidance for aggregations. Um, and they did that for Valley Green Energy. Okay. So if we had feedback, someone if someone had feedback, um, we'd go through you and then you'd go to them? Yeah, that's probably a good way to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Gabi. Um, it, it being already 508, um, do you do you want to share briefly about net metering credit rebalancing? Yeah, sure. I can. Um, yeah, I can make it brief. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So 
I'll just provide a quick background, um, and we did inform the six departments about this. Um, so as you're all aware, I'm sure, the city received solar credits from two PV arrays, uh, Spencer Meadow and Amoresco. Um, these solar credits are allocated to specific accounts throughout the city, which reduces spending, obviously. Um, so when we first started, um, CAPA noticed that the solar credits were not being allocated um, in a way that was maximizing the benefit. Um, so, and it was, in fact, it was costing the city thousands of dollars each year. Uh, so we rebalanced allocations based on the actual account usage um, in order to increase the savings. Um, and some accounts um, received different allocation percentages. Um, and therefore different bills uh, from different sources uh, that they were used to. Some small accounts stop receiving allocations altogether. Um, and overall, this should create um, decreased spending for the city um, on electricity. Um, so as part of the rebalancing process, um, we made available $183,000, which will go towards energy efficiency projects, uh, mainly for SVA, SVA, HS, and Forbes Library. Um, and there were some unexpected issues that arose. Um, so some of the solar credits have not been added to the national grid accounts yet, uh, but they should be added on the next bill cycle. Uh, and then also some some of the invoices from Spencer Meadow and Amoresco came out earlier than we expected. Um, and we didn't think that the allegations, allocation changes would be implemented this bill cycle. So in order to kind of deal with these issues, uh, we emailed each department and we informed them um, of, of the solar credit changes um, and how it would affect each, in depart each individual department. Uh, so we kind of, we kind of, we, re we we reviewed with them um, like who they used to get the solar credits and bills from, and then where they would be getting solar credits and bills from in the future. Uh, we told them how the allocation percentage will change and the invoice amount, how that will change as well. Uh, and we also calculated how much money in credits they should be receiving on their next national grid bill and how that compares to the invoice. And pretty much for every department, the invoice amount is less than the amount credited to the national grid bill. Um, so overall, mm -hmm. in conclusion, uh, I the solar allocation rebalancing went well. Um, some departments definitely um, made out better than others. Um, but yeah, so it, that's, yeah, I just wanted to provide an update. I wasn't sure if you want to add anything, Ben. No, I, this was again, mainly wanting to inform this group uh, because there was some confusion, mainly because we, uh, like like Gabby said, didn't expect it to show up on this bill cycle. And so people were surprised and we hadn't given them the warning. Um, but if you end up having discussion about this, uh, certainly obviously refer them back back to us. But um, And we'd just like to know if you're hearing uh, any uh, issues that people are having or concerns. Um, because overall, this, this isn't a... It's actually a pretty significant uh, savings. We're basically paying, depending on 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 the the, the uh, net metering supplier, uh, you know, uh, seven uh, seven cent or uh, seventy cents on the dollar, or um, or sixty cents on the dollar. So it's it's a pretty good deal. Um, but we were prior to this just kind of throwing the money into accounts that couldn't use them. Uh, so any questions on that? Otherwise, uh, we'd love to have department head updates if anyone doesn't have any discussion on that. Okay. Any department head? Yes, Louis. Oh, you're muted. That information about the uh, energy code changes to the energy code today and not really ready to... Um, go into the specifics, but um, they characterize them as modest amendments. And I think that's uh, um, not the word I would have used, um, but some things of, um, it's gonna, the most obvious thing is that some of the very specific, uh, uh, um, some of the changes to the uh, ex existing building criteria is going to be a whole lot easier to meet. So I thought that some of the energy code criteria was going to uh, basically make some 
renovations impossible, um, but they've also, um, and for me, the thing that's not modest about it is uh, embodied carbon. And they've looked at the way embodied carbon can affect a, a project, uh, you know, including the type of insulation, the source of the insulation, things like that. And it's it's going to be a pretty big change. I'll uh, um, I, I I'll see if there's something specific that I can send around that that has um, you know not so much detail in it, um, a, a sort of a bigger picture. Um, but at this point, it's you know it's like six hundred pages of modest amendments. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Uh, actually, when you do have that update, I I know I'd be really interested in that. Sure. Yeah. Carolyn, do you have any anything you want to share? Uh, a couple of things. One is um, that we just this afternoon had some correspondence with um, Senator Comerford's office about the request to be one of the pilot communities for opt-in, for the, I'm sorry, fossil fuel free um, pilot across the Commonwealth. Apparently DOER is on the cusp of making a decision about whether it's gonna be us or Somerville. <laughs> um, hmm. So we, so that should be coming soon. Um, they were in meetings today. So I don't know if that means that decisions today. So we'll should know shortly. Um, and, um, you know, I think all of us on the city side put our best foot forward to present why we were a good candidate. Um, and so we'll see what happens. Um, all the other candidates are in Eastern Mass um, and uh, range in, in community side. Um, and then the only other thing is Yay, bike share launched yesterday. So um, we're, um, I think that went off pretty well. So we'll see what happens over the next um, few weeks. But, you know, if you guys want to be the um, distribution of website information for people to sign up, it's valleybike.org. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's about it. Cool. Uh, well, if no one has anything else. Do we have a motion to adjourn? A motion to make a motion to adjourn. Second. And Carolyn seconds. Uh, so I shall call the roll. Uh, Louis. Yes. Eric. Yes. Carolyn. Yes. Deb. Yes. Ben. Yes. Okay. We are adjourned.